embrace her. Tandy is prepared to rest her head against her mother's big breasts. She's ready to drop her shoulders and let her mother rub them. Tell her that it will be all right, that Clover got what he deserved. The embrace is a sweet one, one Tandy had forgotten until now. Her mother's love is as vicious and domineering as her personality. Once it's felt, there's none other like it. Tandy relaxes in Dolores' embrace, allowing herself to, to be rock back and, rocked back and forth like a baby. But then it's cut short. Slowly, Dolores pries Tandy off her and holds her at arm's length. I want you to come to your senses and turn that boy in. Everything I'm for a reason and that was it, Dolores says. Do it for all of it, Tandy. He was defending me, Tandy says. The devil is a liar. Him kick you down, but it don't mean you can't get back up and use the tool him fling give you. What Clover did is history. Something long gone. So put it behind you and do the right thing. It is a brute mama, shh. You go and pay for cursing the dead. The Lord pulls Tandy closer again and rocks her in her bosom. She smells like the green banana she sliced up. She runs her fingers through Tandy's hair as she speaks. You and that boy, Charles, shouldn't mix in the first place. Asma say, if you go pick up with us, it's enough woman it happened to, and it didn't kill them. What will set you free is money. Don't say me never teach you that. I send you to good schools for good reasons, yes? But it's also for you to learn common sense. You think, you think because Charles say love you, that you worth it? You think because him say I want you, that he mean it? That he's not wanting him after and when he get it, him run? What is this love, eh? You don't know nothing but no love. Love is foolish. You ever see love put running water in a pipe? No. <laughs> <laughs> you ever see love build a roof over your head? You ever see love give free education, especially to those children whose, whose parents can't afford it? You ever see love fill up with cupboard? You ever see love hand with visas to get far from this rat hole? <laughs> what can love do for you? How you want love to a stranger when you don't even know what love is? He will just take advantage of you and walk away. You forget your return in dollars, not cents. And besides, who gonna want a naive girl like you? But suppose him did really want you. Could you really love somebody who is an absolute fool when it comes on to these things? Somebody who green? You wouldn't want that, and neither would he. You're giving him everything for free. Boys like stupid girls like that. They take one look at your black face and know you're desperate enough to spread your legs at the first compliment. They say, you tr they say your true color before you tell them your name. They know they can't tell you anything and your black self believe it and accept it. How we so used to getting the leftovers? Who you know really love a black girl for more than what's between our legs? You is a pretty black girl, but it's my duty as your mother to teach you these things. Put something in your head, child. You know how much money we could have get? 10,000 US dollars. That can take you from here to eternity. Pay for your education and everything. Use your head, child. You can't place more value on this boy and his foolish love over money. If it means a little to you, then you lose everything. Remember this. Nobody love a black girl. Not even ourselves. Now get up and get your pay. I mean, that was, um, that was a very beautiful portion of the book to read, and we are going to get back to that particular um, monologue, and I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Um, Paul, so it's your turn. I'm just going to read from the start. I'm a little sick, so... Uh, Bear with me for a little bit, please. This may be hard to believe, coming from a black man, but I've never stolen anything. <laughs> never cheated on my taxes or at cards. Never snuck into the movies or failed to give back the extra change to a drugstore cashier, indifferent to the ways of mercantilism and minimum wage expectations. I've never burgled a house 
held up a liquor store, never boarded a crowded bus or subway car, sat in a seat reserved for the elderly, pulled out my gigantic penis, and masturbated to satisfaction with a perverted yet somehow crestfallen look on my face. But here I am in the cavernous chambers of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, my car illegally and somewhat ironically parked on Constitution Avenue, my hands cuffed and crossed behind my back, my right to remain silent long since waved and said goodbye to as I sit in a thickly padded chair that much like this country isn't quite as comfortable as it looks. <laughs> Summoned here by an officious looking envelope stamped important in large sweepstakes red letters, I haven't stopped squirming since I arrived in this city. Dear sir, the letter read, congratulations, you may already be a winner. Your case has been selected from hundreds of other appellate cases to be heard by the Supreme Court of the United States of America. What a glorious honor. It's highly recommended that you arrive at least two hours early for your hearing scheduled for 10 a.m. on the morning of March 19th, the year of our Lord. To read from the prologue, because I was going to start from the end anyway. Um, so, um, you know, from the end of the book, uh, I felt like there was no sense of ending with it. And uh, I really want you to talk about your idea of closure because it was the title of the ending of the book. And I, I mean, I have a really um, cr re pretty s curious relationship with closure. I, do not, I, I claim that I do not believe in it. And so I, when I read through your work and I got to that part, I was like, okay, what did you do there? You know, I understand that life is a continuum, but I also really want to understand what you mean by closure. Uh, yeah, I don't have like a solid definition of closure. I, I, I don't know what it feels like necessarily. Death, I guess. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, um, but I think, you know, we, you get programmed, I think, to think that, that things resolve themselves and, you know, that's just it and you go on about your day. But I think, you know, I mean, use the word continuum and I think that's just what happens and, you know, people put things behind them or they don't. And, trauma, all kind of things re resurrect themselves. I mean, you know, nothing ever really goes away, I don't think. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, that's why they try to kill everyone, you know? <laughs> I mean, just so, so it goes away, you know? And okay. yeah. That's, um, that's amazing. Um, it's the same question I'm going to ask you because I, I feel both books were identical in that idea of lacking of an ending, of an appropriate ending. I'm a writer, so I, I understand that s in certain instances, you get to a point in, in, the, in the narrative and you're like, okay, I'm done with the story, you know, it, because l life does not end with happily ever after, right. as you know, we know. And so I want you to take us through um, what exactly was that idea where, where you are, you brought Margot to us at the end of the narrative. She's got everything she ever wanted, and it was just weird, yeah. <laughs> you know? And then she didn't have, she, she's got everything she ever wanted, mm -hmm. and she didn't have everything she <laughs> always wanted right. at the same time. So it was, it was weird in a way. So I, I want you to take us through that idea. Yeah. Yeah. So without spoiling the ending for those of you who never who haven't read the book, and I will yeah. encourage you to buy it afterwards, um, I would definitely um, talk about that. I always tell myself, or well, tell myself really, I'm not a happy ending um, writer, um, and I've even heard Toni Morrison with that before I even published a book, and I always valued that uh, because you know what? Um, usually, you know, when we read, read children's book or when books were read to us as children, you know, fairy tale, happily ever after, was because you know at, at that point in our um, in our um, you know in, in our childhood we needed that closure right we needed to be told the world is a nice happy place right but I feel like um, for books that, for adults um, for books about real life it's really um, too much to just tie it up with a nice bow at the end of it right life goes on as Paul was saying and I feel like you know for a character like Margot my main character in here comes the son um, she's this woman very complicated um, you know here she is in a country like Jamaica um, like Nigeria, where upward mobility is really hard. You have to know the right people. You have to have the money to, to go to school. We don't have free education there. So if you're, uh, um, you're already 
get a disadvantage if you don't have that kind of money. If you're a working class Jamaican man or woman, right? Um, so you, you bear the brunt of that. So Margot is that woman, right? She was not handed that lovely cake Right? She had to work hard by any means necessary to put food on the table. And so for her story, um, you know, I, I say it's a tragic one, but it's also a lovely one. Um, well, we'll discuss what the lovely is. But with Margot, who wants to send her sister to school, she does a lot, in, including prostitution, prostituting herself and, and ends up becoming a madame herself, right? Um, getting these group of girls to satisfy these men who are coming to the island, yes, for good weed, but also good sex. Um, and so Margot, you know, she has to shut off a part of herself to do that, right? To put food on the table. Uh, but meanwhile, Margot is doing all this. She's secretly, she's in love with another woman, Verdine Moore. Um, and so that's another thing you can't talk about in Jamaica, right? Because homopho it's a highly homophobic country. Um, no matter what people say, you know, the tourism board might say, oh, that's, that's a lie, because they want tourists to come to the island. But I'm saying it's a highly homophobic country. And it also depends on who you are. So if you're an upper class um, person, um, LGBTQIA person, you're fine. You could, you know, do whatever you do in your nice um, gated um, town or house, right? You own the business, so if anybody finds out that you're gay, you're not going to be fired, right? So you still have you still have um, agency. Whereas a working class Jamaican gay or lesbian person, that that's it for them. If anybody finds that out, so can you imagine Margot then in that situation where yes, she does desire Verdi more. She'll never call herself a lesbian, but um, at the end of the day, and she ends up choosing um, choosing money over love, right? She didn't know what love is, and for her, it was more, for her survival was more, um, was actually something that she valued more than what that is. So and, um, just without giving it away, what Tulu um, was, um, was getting to was why, why didn't I give Margot everything at the end, and the, 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 um, the end of, at the end of the day, it's impossible to do that, right? Right now I'm here, I'm privileged enough to be here um, on this um, panel, but I also lived a situation in Jamaica where, where I grew up working class as well. A lot of my colleagues, my best friends, are not um, given this privilege here, right? So yes, it's really, for me, to tie up the, the loose and would be, um, it would be unrealistic, you know? Um, that's, that's actually very brilliant. Um, yeah. Reply. Um, so, going back to the same thing, um, the relationship between Margot and Dolores was rather compelling, wasn't it? And um, and I say this in relation to how how it seemed like like hatred was woven with time within the narrative. It was, I mean, the age, the level of hatred was. I I mean, I I I couldn't get it because like I I have a whole. Um, on, I have a whole different understanding of, you know, mother to um, to child relationship. So I, I I I just didn't get it. Like so, I'm trying to really understand um, how you were able to write both of these characters, um, Dolores and Margot. How were you able to write both of them so honestly? And they were so they are their family, and yet they were so different at the same time. Yeah, um, so, okay, again, the hatred that you mentioned, um, yeah. generational, right? Yeah. Like, like I mentioned before, before I read the excerpt, Dolores is our, the voice of our post-colonial scars. So, you know, nobody loves a black girl, not even herself. That's what Dolores and, um, internalized as a black girl, now a black woman in Jamaica. That's what yeah. a lot of our women still think to this day, um, believe that. And even if we're, and even in a country like Nigeria, you know, um, I feel like, you know, a black population, yes. But at the same time, we have internalized so much. Um, sometimes it's so subconscious that we don't, we don't even notice it, right? And so for Dolores, she, we, we, we tend to mother the way how we were mothered. So here's a woman who's telling her black daughter, listen, the world is not going to give you a pedestal, right? So let me, uh, uh, my love for you is to tell you that before you go, to, go out of that house and disappoint yourself into thinking otherwise. And that's really where Dolores is coming from as a mother, right? So she imparts this on both her daughters. Um, thank you for that reply also. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a kind of, identical situation with Bonbon and his father. Um, I, I really want you to take us through that. I, I do not want to believe abuse is part of um, black identity, but it felt that way reading both of you, you know? Yeah, so I, I, want, us, I want you to tell, like, take us through what, 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 it, what like, occurred to, you know? Yeah, I don't know, I think abuse is just part of the human. 
you know, she never like said, hey, as black kids, this is what you're up against, you know? And so, and I think me and my sisters are all pretty appreciative of it because we just had to figure it out for ourselves, you know? And there was no kind of, you owe this, you need to do this. You know, there was just, you know, she just kind of just threw us out there. You know, she taught me how to ride a bike by putting me at the top of the hill and just like, <laughs> it's totally true. But uh, yeah, so, you know, and it's, she wasn't abusing me, you know. <laughs> she has abused me, but that wasn't the case. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, so it's, but I, I think, you know, it's, you know, you, mother's mother, you know, I think that's, you know, something I learned in psychology and, and so, and I kind of, I didn't model the father on my mom, but it is so much about my mom, you know, because I think in the States there's this, you know, there's like a trope that two-parent household, you have to have a man in the household, all this other crap, you know, where it's, what helps is if you have money, you know, so, and you don't necessarily need two people. And so that's like, you know, I'm just very appreciative and respectful for what my mom was able to do with limited resources with us, you know, three uh, kind of fuck up kids, but uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so from so much of that is not about like the message or anything, but it's just about me thinking about my mom and how she raised us. And she, you know, my mom, she's a huge fan of Japanese culture. Okay. So part of our blackness was she tried to raise us Japanese for like three years. Aww. So, but it's, you know, it's my mom's kind of, this is how she operates, you know? So I don't like talking about it very much. I, I can talk about it a little bit, but like I don't talk about the detail. But it was, you know, it's, she just kind of never told us this is how you're supposed to be, you know? And so I, I, I'm just very thankful for that. Okay, awesome. Um, in the final chapter of the book, um, for Chesha says to, I think it was, there, there was this conversation between himself and Bonbon, and he was saying that America has finally paid its debt to black people. And um, I, I found that statement really um, curious. And I'm putting it to you as the author of that book, not to the character. Of course, you know about the character. Like, um, at that time, when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, did you feel at any point that, um, you know, America did pay his debt. Me? No. Uh, yeah, I mean, I voted for the guy. I thought the best person won, but I, I don't feel pride or any of that sense. I mean, that chapter is actually called Closure, and I think it was like what Nicole was saying is, I think it's interesting about who feels they need closure. And I think it's often the person that's abusing you and oppressing you feels that they need closure. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't think we talk about that yeah. so much, you know. Exactly. And so, like, that chapter actually comes from a, you know, it's one of my best friends. Oh. And, and, I mean, it's about, like, after Obama won, he had a flag on his car. You know, he had an American flag. You know, I've known the guy 30 years. And I was like, a flag? You know, why now? Why today? And he said, oh, I feel like the country's paid his debts. Oh, wow. And I, I didn't know. I didn't say anything to him. I just said, okay, you know. But then when I started thinking about it, I think, you know, it's just like this kind of narrow way of thinking, you know, being an American, for better, for worse, you know, the, the place is in debt and has fucked up so much, more than just black people, Native Americans. I mean, there's like a whole long thing, women, pollution, air, animals, you know. And so it just, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a long bit in the book, but it's just the list is long of, you know, the indebtedness, okay. you know, and I just think it's, the shallow to say, even if you feel that, okay, I got mine, I'm cool. I think it's just kind of a weird kind of narrow-minded, not selfish necessarily, okay. but it's just, you're tied to so many different things. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Thank you for that reply. I, I mean, it's, um, that's a kind of reply I, like, I was really looking forward to because I, I felt like, okay, this is weird. You know, <laughs> um, because as a Nigerian, I was, I was, I mean, I felt like your book was a recurring um, conversation on race and identity, and it was, it's something that keeps going on and on and on. Okay, so um, with you, with you, I, I have this last question before we go over to the audience. Um, what, uh, what are the kinds of conversations that you imagined your book would spark up um, while you were writing it? And I mean, like, I mean, your book went through lots of things, 
but I, I, I want to imagine after you were done and then you, w you went back and you read it through and you're like, oh, wow, I wrote that. I mean, like, what were the kinds of conversations that you imagined at the time? Gosh. Um, so w while I was writing the book, I, I never, when I start a new project, I never read, like to imagine what would be the response, yeah. you know, because that would, you know, that's a uh, setup for writer's block. Um, but the one, one thing I, um, after coming out of the process and, you know, finally, you know, getting a chance to sit back and reflect, I, I deem Here Comes the Sun as a love letter to Jamaica. Um, why? Because most of the issues that I just listed earlier on, right, identity, sexuality, race, class, displacement on the island, and the displacement is usually the working class population that, that gets pushed to the margin, and nobody really talk about us, right, the, who, who we are, the people behind that fantasy, that paradise. Um, for me, I really wanted Jamaicans to read it and see ourselves like holding up a mirror, right? See, we, see where we are now. Um, we, we have no ownership of our country, of our island. And as women, as Jamaican working class women, or w Jamaican women, we have no ownership of our bodies. And, um, and so I wanted that parallel, um, really. So in terms of that conversation, the internalized hatred. So uh, you heard Dolores with the, um, nobody loves a black girl, not even herself. But then there's Tandy, her youngest daughter, who bleaches her skin. Um, to become lighter, right? Um, that, because that's really prominent in Jamaica as well. You know, because th 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 think about colorism and classism that goes hand in hand. Here, Tandy is the one who is supposed to pull the, the family out of poverty, but you, um, but Tandy is really set on becoming lighter skin because in Tandy's eyes, you're not worthy, you're not valuable unless if you're lighter skin. And she's seeing this in, the, in, in our society to this day. It's 2018, and we still have young girls and boys who are bleaching their skin in, on the island. And also here, um, you know, in Ghana, in Nigeria, you know, it's all over, right? Um, and so that's a, a dialogue, a, a conversation I wanted to start. Um, because usually when you hear about people bleaching their skin, you, you actually look at them and laugh. Sometimes if you don't understand it, you're like, oh my gosh, like, she's so stupid. What's going on? Not realizing there's a larger conversation, right? I talk about our post-colonial scars. That's it. We were socialized to hate ourselves. People who are bleaching their skins, they're not, re they're not vain. They're not stupid. What they are, they're re reacting to something that we're not talking about, a huge elephant in the room. And so for me to write a character like Tandy, I wanted to zoom in with my author's lens so that you, can, you guys can actually see that this is an individual, a 15-year-old girl who's thinking she's so unattractive that there's nothing she's gonna, she can do in this life besides lighten her skin. And so I wanted, people to, I wanted to humanize her. Um, you know, without being didactic. Um, another thing I wanted to have a conversation about is a Margo. People also, people also look at prostitutes as like, oh my gosh, you guys are the bottom of the earth. Like, how could you sell your body? Oh my God, look at you, you're a whore. Um, but not realizing that this is a woman, again, society did not hand her a, like a basket of loaves, right? What was she gonna do? And so this, this is somebody in Jamaica, like, because tourism is so huge there, prostitution is huge. Um, because these women who weren't provided the best schooling or they couldn't go to school because some of them, most of them couldn't afford it, they saw fit to use their sexuality. Now, another thing that's, uh, that's underlying that within my book is the sexualization of our younger girls. Now, Tandy, Margot, and Dolores were all sexually abused. And I put that in the book. Like I, I didn't um, flinch in doing that because I also wanted dialogue about that. That's something in our society that we don't talk about. And so with Margot's character, what Margot ends up doing is using that sexuality, wielding her sexuality. After feeling like a victim for so long, she said, no, I'm going to use this back. Like she now holds the sword. And that's really why um, that that, um, the conversation wanted um, me to go with Margot, um, looking at a, a patriarchal society saying, well, you know what? If sex sells and hair, I, I, need my, I, need, I need what to do. Um, and so that's really her perspective. And then, of course, that Dolores' voice that really speaks to the, the invisible women in, in our society again. And, you know, if you notice, I'm, I keep repeating invisible. Like, you know, Toni Morrison would ask, invisible to whom? Well, 
we are invisible to our own people, our own black people in our population. But you know, whites have also read my book and they identify with Tandy, they identify with Margot. Why? Because that, you know, we've all been there, no matter where, we, where, where we're from in society, whether here in Nigeria, Jamaica, or US, we've all felt like insecure at one point. We've all felt like we've not, um, you know, so if you're not a privileged individual, felt marginalized or displaced, you know, all these things that um, it's, I, I bear, pair it down to the human experience. And so I really appreciate reading it to Jamaicans and reading a, a Margot's scene and scare, being scared for my life, given that Margot, this lesbian scene between her and Verdine, and realizing, oh my God, there are Jamaican men in the back. What's going to happen now? And then realizing that they're coming up to me saying, no, I love the love story here, right? If you're an adult and you've experienced love and loss, you're going to connect to Verdine and Margot's love story. And so that's, um, that's really basically it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I have a final question for you. And um, it's, I think it was Morrison who said um, that she writes for black people. And, you know, I... I mean, I, I thought a lot about this question because um, I read Slumberland and I read Tough, and then I saw a particular, it felt like there's a thread that held all your works together. I mean, I've not, I've not read White Boy, White Boy Shuffle, but I'm going to read it. But I feel like if I read White Boy Shuffle, I'm going to see the same thing there. And the thread was the fact that it felt like you're always trying to save blackness like there's like you have this save your mentality you know that you were always expressing in your in your works and i want to ask you about that what's like um is it something you do intentionally or it's just something that's that seeps into your narratives I don't think I write to, to save blackness, but it's, it's always interesting to me the notion of people trying to save blackness, okay. you know? So, but I, like I said, you're right. I, I do talk about it and I think about it, but it's also for me, it's like the state of blackness, which changes, I think, you know? Okay. And, you know, I, I, I don't write for black people necessarily, you know? And I think so much of writers of color, at least in the States, they, they uh, there's this film called I'm Not Your Negro. Anybody know yes. this movie? I fucking hate the title of that movie. <laughs> because it says so much about who this film is for. Okay. You know? And it's skipping, it's not me, you know? Yeah. And I just, I just feel like there's this target weird audience that people are trying to tap into. It doesn't really interest me because I feel like those narratives are always very black and white and very simple. You know, and that just doesn't interest me necessarily. You know, so I used to joke that I write for people that don't read, you know, which is definitely included, <laughs> you know, because, you know, because I was trying to tap into things just from my own background, my own imagination that were important to me, but might not be important to other people, you know, to these other audiences. But just, I don't know, Nicole talked about earlier, which is I just try to write about the things that are important to me. And, you know, with the sellout, it's kind of, you talked about a love letter to Jamaica. It's not quite a love letter, but my wife was in the back of my mind, you know, for a lot of that book. She's in it like a ton, you know. And she's, you know, she, she knows me. So I can kind of not talk to her, but I can, she can listen in and, you know, laugh, judge, whatever. And, you know, I'm not, I'm going to feel okay about it. So, uh, so, yeah, it's not like I'm not trying to do that necessarily. I think, you know. I don't know if it's changed or if it's the same, but I, I, I just, I, I, I can't write thinking about an audience. Like, I can't. Like, I'm not trying to serve anyone. I'm not trying to make anybody feel good, necessarily, or make anyone feel bad, either. You know, but I, I just, I got some shit I've been thinking about. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm just trying to get out there, you know, and I think, again, my wife says it. She was like, there are other weirdos out there like you. So it's like, okay, cool. You know, I think it's, you know, and, and yeah, I, I know I'm not alone, you know, and uh, so I, I hope that someone's reading and listening. That's all I can do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it, I feel like it's time to open um, the, I mean, open the, throw the questions to the audience. So if you have questions for either of this, Amazing authors. Okay, uh, where's the roving mic? 
So, yes, um, I saw you and CJ. Okay, CJ, if you go ahead, since okay. the mic is here. Um, my question <laughs> is for you. Um, I have butterflies just being able to ask you this question. <laughs> because when I speak to the book, to someone else's copy, and the, Jam um, the Jamaican patois just screamed out at me. Mm -hmm. And the last time I had been so excited by such work was um, by um, Marlon James. But I, when I was 13, I read um, The Dragon Can Dance by uh, yeah, Lovelace. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I w it was shocking for me at the time I was 13 years old because the books I had read until then, um, they were all the proper way to write, or especially from Nigerian writing, yeah. we everybody was speaking properly, or you know, yeah. yeah. So, um, and when I was having my book, I was I insisted, like I struggled with editors, and eventually my publisher was on my side. Um, was it intentional? The German patois, the Jamaican patois. I'm excited by it. I found similarities between it and then the one spoken in Sierra Leone. The one we are Nigerian pidgin English. Yeah. So is it yeah. central to your writing? Was it yeah, intentional? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Great question, by the way. I yes, it was intentional. I um first of all, we were raised to be ashamed of Jamaican patois, right? Or uh, split Jamaican. That's what we call it, Jamaican, because that's really our language, patois. But you know, of course, we were colonized by the British, so we were taught standard English, and um. You know, the thing, the, the sad part about it was that even in school, if you were caught speaking it aloud, you were punished, right? For me as an author, as an, as an artist, I now want to now own my language. This is a language I think in, this is a language I dream in. Why not write in it as well? You know, I speak it to my family, you know, and so for me, to, to read a book and see two Jamaicans speaking to each other in standard English, that would be so inauthentic. I'll throw it across the room. Because two Jamaicans would not be speaking to each other unobserved in standard English. Like, come on, like, why? why? And so um, it's important for me to write our language. I, I want to preserve our language in, our, in, my, in my art. Um, and another thing, too, you know, it was James Baldwin who said, you know, of course, language is, is our identity, right? So to tell a whole group of people, Jamaicans, do not use your language, that was already number one silencing us. And we were silent for decades, for years. Now it's time for us to rise up, use our art, take our culture back. And so I'm doing it in my, in my dialogue. Yeah. Um, where's the roving mic, please, to if there is here in the front? Um, my question is to Paul, um, and uh, one of the things I found interesting, like, it, the thing I found interesting about your book is how, how much of it is driven by voice. I mean, it's just pure voice almost from the start, and you grip that hit, and that's what drives it all through. And I'm interested in how you, as a writer who was always going to the page to create this thing, was able to sustain it. I mean, in some sense, it's, you had to do that consciously. So you, you had to make it humorous. You had to keep that voice as strong as it was. And it, I know for a fact that can be an easy task to pull off. So I'm interested in it. Yeah, uh, Nicole was talking about like trying to do a, an authentic language. And for me, I think, not my task or anything, but I think I'm, I try to, I'm trying to create a new language in a weird way, you know? trying to like fuse a bunch of different languages, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, my academic language, the way I speak to my friends, my mom, you know, and the way I think, you know, and so it's, it's a bunch of stuff that I, I, I'm trying to turn into a single thread, I think. And uh, I was on a, I used to write poetry, and I was on a panel once, it was about translation, and I kept asking, I don't know why I'm on this panel, <laughs> but, but, Another guy said to me, he said, because you do an English to English translation. And that made sense to me, you know, and because that's what I'm trying to do. It's like fuse all this stuff in there. Like much of what like Patois is, it's a fusion of a lot of stuff, you know. So I'm trying to, you know, just create a thing. So that voice for me is, is driven by this character and kind of the way he thinks. It's like, how do I articulate these thoughts on the page, you know? Uh, it's not the way I speak necessarily, but how, how do I do it? It's just just keep my butt in the chair, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I just, uh, I try to con stay consistent. I try not to uh, censor myself, you know? And uh, I, I don't really, um, really get inspired. I get inspired very rarely. 
But I think what I try to replicate is the feeling of when you see something that inspires you. You know, when your hair stands on your arms, you know, Sarah Vaughn singing, whatever it is, you know, that thing. And so I, it's not like I take what they do, but I try to remember how I felt and try to kind of make myself feel that way, you know, to feel like I'm always on the edge of my chair a little bit. Like I'm always trying to go, what the fuck is this motherfucker talking about, you know? <laughs> and it's like I just try to stay in that for as long as I can. And t it just takes a long time, really. That's all I can say. Awesome. Um, so um, there's still time for more questions. Who? Oh, one more question. <laughs> okay, one more question. Okay, so that guy. Yeah. Can we have a woman as well? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So after you, then, then, her, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. My question goes to Mr. Paul. You made mention in your comment that you are grateful that your mom did not create any, or did not tell you what to do or what not to do, how to approach the world that you met there. How do you think this affects us now, particularly the younger ones, and all the other discussions, socially, whether feminism, racial, or racism, and all that, about being told what to do or how to attack or be defensive? So, no, so let, let's get the last question first, uh, so you answer everything together. Uh, time is up. Hello. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Yeah, good. My question is for Nicole. It's connected to the question he asked you about language. And I noticed when you were reading, um, Dolores speaks in Patois, mm -hmm. and um, Bumago thinks in distinct English, like British English. And I was wondering, um, did you do that on purpose, make the distinction between the two generations? Yeah. Or because you already mentioned that, okay, it wasn't like they, um, they had so many educational opportunities. So how did she um, become elevated to that point if um, basically based on what you said, she didn't have that proper schooling? So was that on purpose? What were you trying to achieve with that? That's my question. Okay. Uh, so um, Paul, okay. Um, so just to piggyback off what I've said before, um, so it was a conversation between Dolores and Tandy. So Tandy is actually the one who went to the Catholic high school. Um, and so, of course, in Catholic high school, that's where we learn as girls and as boys as well to speak standard English. You know, um, If a teacher is in... Um, it's right next to you, you can't be speaking it. If a prefect is walking around, you can't speak it. So in that, you actually train to swallow your own tongue. And so Tandy um, has this um, internal conflict because at home, you know, now she can't speak Pato even to her own mother. Um, or when she speaks, it is very limited as opposed to how Dolores speaks and how Margot, her older sister, can go back and forth. I mean, because Margot works at the, um, as an hotel clerk, but at home, she speaks it freely. But Tandy is actually the one who... She, you know, swallows her tongue. In addition to that, bleaching her skin. Because for her, becoming white or becoming or the, like the ruling class is more important to her to feel valuable or value, val worthy, I should say. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, I don't know how it affects the bigger society. I, I don't know. But I think is, I think, for me, I, you know, I always felt like I wasn't allowed to make any mistakes, <laughs> you know? And I understand that because the stakes are, are, are high and different, you know? But still not being able to allow to make any mistakes really impinged on my freedom a little bit. You know, you have to talk like this. You gotta show up wearing a sweater. You gotta do this, you gotta, it just. And so sometimes when you're not given the freedom to fail, you know, and people telling you that it's okay to fail, you know? That, and I understand like where the rhetoric comes from. I completely, I get it, you know. But I, I, I was lucky that my mom gave us room to fail, which we did all the time, you know. And you know, I think about my friends. It's not gonna make any sense, but I think about my friends who got bused to white schools, and all those kids. This is like in junior high, and all those kids were doing drugs, popping pills, and my friends started doing that stuff along with them. And these are black friends, and. One of the things that was interesting is my friends, their trajectories was different than their white friends, oh, you know? Yeah. And, but, you know, they all did what they did and 
fortunate for enough, you know, they kind of figured it out on their own. That doesn't happen for everybody, you know, it's like, but I, I just, I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. I can't answer that, you know, but it's, uh, but you're just constantly being told, you've got to do this, you have to do this, and it's just, it's hard to maneuver. It was hard for me to maneuver, at least, you know, and hard for me to figure out what it is that I'm really thinking about. I always say this, and I always feel bad, but when I was in junior high, I got a, a copy of Maya Angelou's Why the Caged Bird Sings. I was in seventh grade, I started reading this book, I'm depressed, you know, and I was like, why do they feel the need to give me this? You know, they never give me any other books. But they don't, you know, it's just like, they don't give me Maya Angelou and something else. You know, you just get this one note all the goddamn time. You know, this weird, sober note. And that just, somehow, that just didn't sit right with me. Right. Huh. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I, um, I really would like to say a very special thank you um, I always thank our guests and our African guests, but trust me, sometimes it's just that little bit more complex and um, complicated when you're trying to bring um, guests to Nigeria because we have such a great reputation. <laughs> no 419, no violence, nothing. It's great. So, but anyway, I just want to thank Nicole and Paul for agreeing to come to Aki Festival to spend this time with us. Thank you so much. This means a lot to us. Um, we've been selling your books. I mean, last year, of course, Paul, we've been, we've got a great relationship with One World, as you know. So um, it's great that you're here, and I hope your hand begins to ache. <laughs> so on that note, please take your photographs. Um, where's the photographer? Oh, there they are. So while they're doing that, they're, you can go and start buying the books if you want them and getting them signed in the signing area. Just go there now. Um, and then we've got two sessions, which will start in five minutes. We've got music as a vehicle for change here with Salawa Beni, Tomaletto Serizzi, and Brimo. And then, is Africa really open for business? Will take place in the Namdi Azikiwe Hall. Thank you.